Picture this, a single cylinder motorcycle beating inline fours and V-twins that had twice the displacement and triple the cylinders. In 1993, Ducati built a race bike so improbable that when it crossed the finish line ahead of factory Hondas and Yamahas, the paddock couldn't believe what they were seeing. This is the story of the Ducati Super Mono, the one-cylinder wonder that rewrote the rules of motorcycle racing. The year was 1992 and Ducati was in trouble, really in trouble. The company had been bleeding money for years, their street bikes weren't selling, and their racing program was consuming budgets they didn't have. The Kajiva Group, which owned Ducati at the time, was considering pulling the plug entirely. Meanwhile, there was this peculiar racing class gaining popularity across Europe, Sound of Singles. It was a series exclusively for single-cylinder motorcycles, originally created as an affordable entry point for privateer racers. The rules were simple, one cylinder, maximum 800cc for four strokes, 500cc for two strokes, most teams were running modified dirt bikes or cobbled together specials. Nobody was taking it seriously. Nobody except Massimo Bordi, Ducati's technical director who saw an opportunity everyone else had missed. Bordi had a radical idea. Instead of building a budget racer for privateers, why not create the ultimate single-cylinder superbike, use it as a technology demonstrator, a Halo product that would showcase Ducati engineering at its finest. The board thought he was insane. Develop an expensive race bike for a minor racing series while the company was nearly bankrupt? But Bordy had done the math. The development cost would be a fraction of their World Superbike program, and the technology they developed could trickle down to production bikes. More importantly, winning with a single cylinder against multi-cylinder bikes in open classes would be the kind of David versus Goliath story that builds legends. After months of arguments, he got the green light. The budget was microscopic, less than what Honda spent on catering for their race team. They had 18 months to create something extraordinary. The project started in a back corner of the Bologna factory with just five engineers. No fancy CAD systems, no million dollar flow benches, just drafting tables, calculators, and decades of combined experience. The heart of the Super Mono would be based on Ducati's existing 888 V-Twin, but using only the vertical cylinder. This wasn't just sawing a twin in half, though. Single cylinders have a fundamental problem, massive vibration. Every time the piston fires, there's nothing to balance it out. At high RPM, this vibration can literally shake the bike apart. Most manufacturers solve this with heavy counterweights and rubber mounting, which killed performance. Ducati's solution was brilliant and bizarre. They created what they called a dummy piston, essentially a second con rod and piston that moved in opposition to the real one. But instead of having its own cylinder, it just pumped air in a sealed chamber. This phantom piston weighed exactly the same as the real one, moving in perfect opposition to cancel out primary vibrations. The engineering was so precise that the balance factor had to be calculated to three decimal places, 1% off, and the crank would tear itself apart at 10,000 RPM. The real cylinder was a work of art. Displacement was 5,000 cc initially, with a bore of 100 mm and stroke of 70 mm. That's massively over square. A configuration that lets an engine rev, but usually sacrifices torque. The compression ratio was 11.5.1, relatively mild by race standards, but the magic was in the head. Ducati fitted their Desmoquattro 4-valve system, the same technology from their World Superbike winning 888s. Instead of springs, the valves were closed by a second set of rocker arms and cams. This desmodromic system meant the valves could follow incredibly aggressive cam profiles without float, even at astronomical RPM. The intake valves were 42 mm, the exhausts 30 cm huge for a single cylinder. At full throttle, this thing was inhaling 400 liters of air per second. Feeding that appetite was a 54 mm Delorto throttle body, bigger than what most liter bikes were running. But here's where it gets clever. The fuel injection system was fully programmable with eight separate mapping zones. The ECU could adjust injection timing to 0.1 millisecond precision based on throttle position, RPM, and even atmospheric pressure. Remember, this was 1983. Most sport bikes were still running carburetors. The frame was pure pornography for chassis nerds. Chrome molybdenum steel trellis, each tube positioned using finite element analysis to create the perfect balance of rigidity and flex. The steering head angle was adjustable from 23 to 25 degrees. The swing arm pivot could be moved 20 mm horizontally and 10 mm vertically. The single-sided swing arm itself was a work of art. Cast in one piece from aluminum, it weighed just 3.2 kilograms, but could handle 500 newton meters of torque without flexing more than 0.5 cm. The whole chassis weighed 11 kilograms. A modern Panagale frame weighs 13. The front end ran 42 mm forks, 
fully adjustable for compression, rebound, and preload. The rear shock was also Ulan's, mounted horizontally under the fuel tank and connected to the swing arm through a complex rocker system. This gave a rising rate linkage with 120 pedal of wheel travel, but kept the center of gravity incredibly low. Brakes were Brembo, naturally. Twin 320 mp floating rotors up front with four piston calipers. The rear ran a single two-tier upmediator disc with a two-piston caliper. The master cylinders were adjustable for leverage ratio. Riders could fine-tune brake feel by changing the pivot point. Dry weight came in at 102 kilograms, that's 268 pounds. A modern Yamaha R1 weighs 448 pounds. The finished engine produced 77 horsepower at 10,500 RPM and 51 newton meters of torque at 8,500 RPM. Those numbers might not sound impressive until you consider the power to weight ratio. 630 horsepower per ton. That's better than a Ferrari F40, but numbers only tell part of the story. The first test session at Misano was scheduled for March 1993. Veteran tester Vance Proctor climbed aboard, thumbed the starter, and the Super Mono barked to life with a sound nobody had heard before. Not the lazy thump of a big single, but a sharp, angry crack that echoed off the pit walls. First gear, clutch out, and Proctor disappeared down the straight trailing a sound like machine gun fire. The telemetry later showed he hit 147 mup on the back straight, on a single cylinder. The lap times were staggering. Around Misano, the Supermano was turning laps just two seconds slower than Ducati's factory 888 Superbike. That 888 had twice the cylinders, 300cc more displacement, and 35 more horsepower. The Supermano was beating 600cc four-cylinder bikes outright. At tracks with tight sections like Brands Hatch and Cadwell Park, it was untouchable. The combination of featherweight chassis and instant torque meant it could brake later, turn faster, and accelerate earlier than anything in its displacement class. Ducati entered the Super Mono in the 1993 Sound of Singles European Championship with factory support. The competition didn't know what hit them. At the first race at Monza, the Super Mono qualified on pole by 3.2 seconds. That's an eternity in motorcycle racing. By mid-season, other teams were protesting, claiming Ducati had violated the spirit of the rules by spending so much on development. The organizers checked the bike thoroughly. It was completely legal, just better engineered than anything else on the grid. But the Supermono's real test came in the British Sound of Thunder series, where it raced against bikes up to 1300cc. At Donington Park, the Supermono finished fourth overall, beating several Ducati 900SS twins and modified Harley Davidsons with more than twice its displacement. The British press called it the giant killer. At club races, privateers on Supermonos were regularly embarrassing riders on GSX R750s and CBR 900RRs. The motorcycle world was forced to reconsider everything they thought they knew about engine configuration. Here's where it gets really interesting. The development cost for the entire Supermono project was 2.8 billion lire, about $1.7 million in 1993 dollars. Honda spent more than that just developing the fuel tank for the NR750. Ducati built exactly 67 Supermonos between 1993 and 1995. The first 25 were pure race bikes sold to selected customers for 45 million lire each, about $28,000. Expensive, but less than a factory Yamaha TZ250 two-stroke racer. The remaining bikes were slightly detuned straight ale versions with lights and a license plate holder, though calling them street legal was optimistic. These sold for 38 million lire. Every single one was hand-built by a team of three. Technicians in a corner of the race shop, each engine took 40 hours to assemble. The frames were welded by one man, Giuseppe Ostinelli, who'd been building Ducati chassis since 1978. He could reportedly tell if a frame was straight to within 0.5 on OEB just by eye. The fuel tanks were hand-formed from aluminum by Germano Ghiani, who shaped each one slightly differently based on the rider's dimensions. No two Supermonos were exactly identical, the race results speak for themselves. Between 1993 and 1997, Supermonos won 47 international races, including three European championships and two British titles. At the Isle of Man TT in 1994, Robert Dunlop lapped at a 116.73 Embraer average speed on a Supermono, faster than the 600 CUEC production bikes. The lap record at Cadwell Park stood for six years, but the real victory was in the technology transfer. The fuel injection mapping strategies developed for the Supermono became the basis for Ducati's 916 system. The chassis geometry data informed every sport bike Ducati built for the next decade. The dummy piston balance system was patented and licensed to other manufacturers. 
even the racing class it was built for, evolved because of it. Sound of Singles events went from club-level curiosities to internationally televised races. Other manufacturers were forced to respond. BMW built the supermono-inspired F650 Funduro. KTM developed the 620 Duke. Yamaha created the SZZ or i 660 An entire market segment existed because one company decided to take a backwater racing series seriously. In 2024, an original race spec Supermono sold at Bonhams for 167,000 dealers. That's more than a new Lamborghini. The buyer was a collector from Japan who already owned Ford other Ducatis. He said he bought it not as an investment, but because it represented everything pure about motorcycle engineering. The pursuit of perfection without compromise, without committees, without focus groups. Just engineers asking how fast can we make one cylinder go. The Supermono proves something fundamental about racing, about engineering, about the very nature of speed itself. You don't need overwhelming power to win. You don't need the latest technology or the biggest budget. What you need is to understand the problem completely, then solve it elegantly. Ducati looked at everyone else adding cylinders, adding complexity, adding weight, and asked a different question. What if we perfect one cylinder instead? In an age of 200 horsepower superbikes with electronic everything, the Supermono remains a reminder that sometimes less truly is more. It's the mechanical embodiment of focus, of doing one thing absolutely right rather than many things adequately. Every engineer who's ever had to compromise, every designer who's had their vision diluted by committee, every racer who's been told they need more power to win, they all understand what the Supermono represents. It's proof that brilliance beats brute force, that elegant solutions outlast complex ones, that sometimes the answer isn't to add more, but to perfect what you have. Today there are maybe 30 running Supermonos left in the world. The others are in museums or private collections, too valuable to risk on a track. But occasionally at vintage racing events, you'll hear that distinctive bark echoing off the grandstands. And for a moment, everyone stops to watch a single cylinder embarrass bikes with three times the displacement, just like it did 30 years ago. Because physics doesn't care about fashion, mathematics doesn't follow trends, and a perfectly engineered solution remains perfect forever. What's the most impressive single-cylinder machine you've ever encountered? Drop a comment below and share your story. And if you want more tales of engineering underdogs that change the game, make sure you're subscribed. Next time, we're diving into the rotary engine that nearly won Le Mans. Until then, keep those engines singing no matter how many cylinders they have.